Hawla bint Tha'laba radiyallahu anha, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was from Medina. From Medina, the women of Medina were known to have very assertive personalities, very dynamic personalities, so much so that Umar radiyallahu anhu said that when the women from Mecca migrated to Medina, they started to take the habits of the women from Medina and be, of being really like intense in marriage. And Khawla radiyallahu anha, one day, there's different narrations of exactly what took place, but she had an argument with her husband, Aus radiyallahu an. And he said to her, he said, you are like my mom's back to me. That kind of sounds strange, but what the intention of that time meant, you're like my mom, so I no longer, basically, there, he no longer wants to be married to her. And when he said this to her, he then left the home, and he came back later. When he came back later, he tried to initiate contact in a very G-rated way, I'm going to say that, because they had different ages in the room. And when that happened, she said no, and she physically pushed him, and then went to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now she's with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she is trying to understand whether or not she is still married to this man, because this is before the verses surrounding Islamic law and divorce came down and the, the um, explanation in the sunnah. And so at this time, this is how divorce was initiated. But she did not want that. And she went to the Prophet wasallam, and she explained what happened. And the Prophet wasallam, because he didn't have revelation yet about what to do, he basically said it's as it was. And she was upset. She was very upset by this. She said that her husband is the most beloved man to her. Her husband was the most beloved man to her. And so she started to make dua. Her dua was very intense. She kept pr praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She turns towards the qibla and she started to make dua for Allah that she's complaining. She brings her sadness. She brings her depth of pain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hoping for some guidance from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when you look at the way that she makes this statement, that she asks Allah, she goes to Allah. It's very similar, subhanAllah, that conversation with Allah. It's very similar to the way that I heard a shaykh making dua, where I saw that dua is different when you go to it with so much pain. There's a difference between, oh Allah, give me good in this life, give me good in the hereafter. Oh Allah, make me successful. Oh Allah, help me with my test. And oh Allah, if you do not answer me, who is going to answer me? Oh Allah, if you turn me away, where am I going to go? Oh Allah, if you do not do something, who's going to do something? Help me, Ya Allah, help me. That call from the depth of her heart, when you have a loved one that you're worried about, when you have a child that you're torn apart over, and you go to Allah with that emotion, and your heart breaking apart, this is how she went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this intensity of emotion, sitting with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Qur'an. He revealed, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. قَدَ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِنُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا تُجَادِنُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوْرَكُمَا that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has heard the one that comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arguing with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and mentioning tashtaki ilallah that she's complaining, she's hurt, she's coming to Allah with this pain. He's, she, Allah has heard their conversation and indeed, Allah is the one who hears and he sees. Sami'un basir. Hears and sees. Ustada Dalia Ayyub, she's doing her PhD of woman in the Quran. 
She said there are 26 women in the Quran, and in every single case of women mentioned, Allah acknowledges their emotional reality. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognized, he heard, and he saw. Why is Samir and Basir so important in this circumstance? When you're having a conversation in the depth of your home, it can very easily turn to he said this, and she said this, and he said this, and she said this. And sometimes you just want someone to acknowledge what happened. You just want someone to acknowledge your pain. You're just seeking a safe space, a refuge where you know that you are hurt. Allah didn't just hear, he also saw. He's not just validating what he heard of their conversation, but also what he saw of her pain. And this is very similar to when the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, who Dr. Rania just so beautifully spoke about, when she makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she had wanted to have a baby. After all of these years of struggling and infertility, which is a very real, real, real struggle in, for so many women. And she went through this, and she's so excited to become a mother. And all of a sudden, her husband passes away. And she goes from the joy of having her first child to the fear of suddenly becoming a widow and not knowing how she's going to raise a child by herself. And what does she do? She calls out to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she says, وَإِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانَ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Sameer, again, the one who hears, but instead of Basir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses his name, Alim, the one who knows. In the circumstance of the mother of Maryam, she doesn't know how she's going to become a single mom. She doesn't know the future of this child who she was waiting for so many years for. She doesn't know what to do. So who assures her? Who reassures her? Who comforts her? Al-Alim. The one who hears her dua to him. The one she's calling out to in pain. And the one who knows her circumstance. So when Khawla radiallahu anha receives this verse, this set of verses, the next few verses as well address her circumstance. Ibn Ashur mentions it wasn't just for her. It was for every believing woman who's seeking justice, that she sought to seek justice, and that she fought, she, she went, she, she didn't simply say, okay, she asked. Radiallahu anha. This is the only surah, Surah Al-Mujadila. This is the only surah in which Allah's name is mentioned in every single verse of the entire surah. Not in an incredibly amazing surah like Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, which is all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So short, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have chosen that his name is in every word, verse. But the only verse he chose for his name to appear, sometimes multiple times, is this surah, which was revealed, the sabab of the revelation, the reason for the revelation, was this woman's, this woman's desperate cry. Some of the scholars of tafsir mention that this surah and this ayah, Allah's name is mentioned four separate times in the very first ayah of that surah. That it is a tafsir of the verse in the Quran that says, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He is with you wherever you are. If he is with you in his knowledge, in his sight, in his, in his hearing, wherever you are, it means no matter what you're going through, you are never alone. It means that whether it's the pain or the joy or the loneliness or the confusion of your life, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you. That he's never, doesn't leave you for, this, for the blink of an eye. He is so close to you. Her example in uh, the Medinan society is actually not that well documented. We don't have so much information about her life. 
But what we have is her example as one of many women of the, of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, who actively were part of interacting with, were the reasons for, and who gave the narrations of the revelation of the Qur'an. Um Ayman radiallahu anha, after the Prophet wasallam passed away, Omar and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhuma said, let's go visit her. They went to go visit her. They went to visit her and she was crying. She started to cry. And they said, why are you crying? Don't you know that what is with Allah is better for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And she responded by saying, I'm not crying because I don't know what is with Allah is better for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm crying because the revelation has been cut off from the heavens. And then Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma both began to cry. Um Hisham bin Haritha, she, men, she memorized Surah Qaf by sitting in the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, and hearing him recite Surah Qaf when he would recite in the Quran or give sermons when he would lead Salah. She memorized this Surah from the lips of the Prophet وسلم, by being present in the masjid. We have women companions who discuss different aspects of the sunnah or different aspects of the revelation because they were actively interacting with the revelation. And that interaction sometimes as women is one that maybe we don't completely see in the same way because we read the Quran for, for sure. We sometimes read the translation, which we should do if we don't understand the Arabic. We memorize it and we review it and we teach it to our kids. But sometimes do we look at the Quran as not just a friend or a book, but a best friend? Do we look at the Qur'an as a refuge? Because looking at the Qur'an as a refuge is a journey. Just like you have a best friend, who's here with their best friend? Anyone raise your hand. Did you meet and in that exact moment where you like, we're best friends? Or was it actually like, I really don't like her and now you're best friends? Sometimes it's a journey to get to the point where you feel close to someone, including your own siblings. Your best friend could be your own sister, but you don't necessarily love her every single second of the day. That journey is a process, but how did you get to that process? You built a relationship. You got to know one another. You learned each other's love languages, even if that wasn't an explicit conversation, but you realize every time you get her a gift, she's like, Thank you, and that's it. She doesn't return them, but she always wants to hang out because her love language is actually quality time. So you see that friendship develop over time. Why don't we do that with the Qur'an? The Qur'an is the ultimate best friend. The Qur'an is the book that we can hug, literally hug, when we are heartbroken. It's the book that we can take to a cafe and sit and drink our coffee and open it. My Sheikh, Sheikh Mahib Fulda, what he does, MashaAllah, his memorization is on such another level that he never looks at the Mus'haf to review. He says it confuses him to look at the Mus'haf to review. But he keeps it open to Surah Al-Baqarah while he's re reviewing Surah Al-Ma'idah and he just looks at the pages. Why? Because he said it's ibadah to just long at the pages. Long for the pages. Look at the pages. Touch the pages. Hold the Qur'an. That example is one we see from the woman companions. Why? We have to recognize the space in which the woman companions receive the revelation. In pre-Islamic Arabia, women were being inherited like property. Their baby girls were being buried alive. So we know that women didn't hold the greatest space in society. Omar radiallahu anhu said, we used to think of woman as nothing. We used to think of woman as nothing. Until what? Until Allah revealed what he revealed and he divided what he divided. How do you think that's going to impact the self-esteem of women who come from a society where women didn't matter? And now suddenly Allah is bringing women into spaces in which women never were before. When we see, for example, in the Quran, there are two daughters of the Qur'an mentions Shaykhun Kabir, like an elder man. Some say it's the Prophet Shu'aib radiallahu an. There's a discussion on who he was. But these two women went to, to get uh, their water for the, the flock of sheep that they were taking care of. 
When do they show up in the Quran? They show up after Musa alayhi salam, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, calls out to Allah and makes a dua. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. I am I, anything you can send down, Ya Allah. I need anything you can send down. The next verse, they show up. And what happens, subhanAllah, when we talk about the woman in the Quran, because often our community very beautifully and very importantly, and of course it's such a beautiful aspect of our religion, talks about modesty and discusses the importance of modesty and the beauty of modesty, absolutely. But sometimes that can become a little obsessive. And it can be stifling. And it can be a place of immense judgment. And so when we talk about this part of the Quran, the Quran describes that one of the women speak to Musa and Allah says, Tamshi ala stihya. She is basically walking on modesty. She's so modest. And then the Quran mentions something else about her. And this aspect of what is mentioned is honestly never really discussed. She goes to her father and she says, Oh, my father, hire him. What do the scholars of Tifsir mention about this verse? Allah did not have to include her statement of, oh, Allah, hire him. Why did Allah include a literal statement of her conversation? It could have just said, Allah could have said, and then Musa went to the family and then he was hired. Or he went through a process and this is why and how it happened. Allah recorded her voice. Why? Because this is a society in which women were not actively involved in financial transactions. Prior to the revelation, prior to Islam, women were not actively involved in economic affairs. Yes, Khadija radiallahu anha was a businesswoman. But that wasn't the norm for women prior to Islam. So scholars of tafsir say that Allah brought women, quoted a woman in financial matters to affirm Woman in the space of economics and finances. There's another verse in the Quran in which Allah talks about loans, financial loans. And many women ask about this verse because the verse says that there are two men who need to be seen to be used as witnesses. And if two men cannot be found, then one man and two women. So many women have asked. Why does it need to be two women to one man? Why not just one woman and one man? Let's consider again the society in which this verse is revealed. Women were not actively involved in financial transactions. So if we're going to talk about only this circumstance, let's only focus on this because rulings for all sorts of witnessing are different depending on the issue. But in loans, in the issue of taking a loan, it's recommended to have it written down and to have the debt contract witnessed. One man's testimony is not enough on his own. He needs another man. If another man is not present, and then two women, why? Why two? Because Allah says if one of them forgets, the other one can remind her. Why? This is the first time they may be exposed to this language. In that society, this is the first time they may ex be being exposed to this conversation. We're not talking about women who have their PhDs in economics, nor women who actively were involved with the stock market or credit cards or anything like that. We're talking about a society in which women's arena was often poetry, sometimes lineage, sometimes medicine, but not necessarily financial transactions. So when we are reading this verse here today in 2023, sometimes we say, well, why wouldn't Allah say just one woman and one man? Why does it need to be two? We're often reading that verse with our own lens, sometimes with our own trauma, absolutely understandable. But in the society it was revealed in, scholars mentioned that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevating women into a space that they were not before. And Allah is the one who brings them into that space, not men, not men who govern a society. That Allah is the one who brings women into this space. 
And that it's not about her not having enough intelligence because like Dr. Amina so beautifully spoke about the Queen of Sheba, that she talks and asks advice from the advisors as the queen. And after she has this conversation on what to do from Suleyman alayhi salam, as she explained, what is the next part of that? And that is how it is. That's what they do. That's what they do. Scholars of tafsir of Quran say that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirming her intelligence. So when we look at a verse like this, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim, they both have a discussion that modern day scholars build on today. And they say that if a woman has the qualification of being involved in these transactions, one woman's testimony is enough. But the important point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every society from the time of revelation, from before the revelation until the end. And he acknowledges that. And in that, every woman who is mentioned in the Quran has a space, a different type of personality, so that every single one of us, no matter what we're going through, no matter what our background is, we all can connect to the woman in the Quran. When we look at Khawla's story, radiallahu anha, what's so fascinating is that her name is not mentioned. In fact, women's names are often not mentioned. Maryam alayhi salam's name is mentioned. But this opens the door for us to be able to connect to the woman without needing to be all of her personality. Women who are going through issues with their husband can understand this part of the verse. Women who are in spaces of leadership can understand the Queen of Sheba. Women who are in different spaces can connect to different women. Because every example is for us to take and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with differently. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us when he says, That my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death is all for Allah. So what is that? It's broad. It's not only if I'm this particular type of woman, only if I have this particular role, only if I do this or don't do this, am I concluded as someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to. Sometimes as women, we may not understand certain aspects because we may not see ourselves in those aspects. And we need to take a step back and ask, is that the Quran or is that maybe the way a particular community is set up in the infrastructure, the architecture and the policies? What does my Lord say to me? And when we see that women are elevated into spaces in which women were not before, we have the example of Maryam alayhi salam, which Dr. Rania just so beautifully talked about. But Maryam alayhi salam, she was brought into the space of Beitul Maqdis as the very first woman. And when she was brought into the space, yes, she worshipped. She fasted and she prayed and she did all of the aspects of ritual worship. But when a man was in her quarters, her private quarters, which no one should have been able to access that she didn't expect. And the tafsir mentions he's a well-proportioned man. He's a very good-looking man, mashallah. And they, she sees this man. Her immediate reaction is to make dawah to him. She doesn't scream and run out of the room, which she has every right to do. She called him back and she says, if you fear Allah, if you, no, no, she didn't say Allah. Who does she call upon? Who? Ar-Rahman. Why would she call upon Ar-Rahman? Because if he had a bad intention, she's reminding him, go back to the one who will forgive you before you even do it. Her worship prepared her for action and calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when she responded in that way, Ibn Kathir mentions that Ibn Jibreel alayhi salam got so scared that he immediately flipped into an angel. He flipped back into his form. And immediately he says, I'm just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. To give you the glad tidings of a son. But in this space, Allah brought her in, Beitul Maqdis, where women had never been. 
In this space, he shows us our role in calling people to Allah through the example of Maryam alayhi salam. And when she has her baby, and she goes out holding that baby and bringing that baby to the people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't order her uncle Zakaria, a prophet alayhi salam, to take that baby. Allah didn't make Jibreel alayhi salam appear as a person or even an angel and take that baby. She had had a baby and Allah ordered her to go out to her people. That's how important her, her presence is. That's how important her role is in calling people to Allah. Every single one of us plays a different role. But what we see from the time of the companions is that their interaction with the Qur'an allowed for the, for the stepping stones of the woman's scholarship throughout history that we have until today. Right now, if you go to Mecca or if you go to Medina, have you been to Mecca or Medina, some of you? Have you seen a woman scholar teaching? Raise your hand if you have. Yes. Yes. Two, three. So you see the chairs in the woman's section. Those chairs are there and the women will sit and they will teach courses. Yes. But you can hear over the speaker that the men are having halaqas, right? You can hear the sheikh and you hear all the men being able to ask questions and you wonder, what if I have a question that I want to ask this sheikh? That setup of how Masjid al-Nabawi is, is very different how it was historically. I was speaking to a woman who grew up in Saudi Arabia. She said when she was six, as a six-year-old girl, she could run around Masjid al-Nabawi with no barriers. She went to every single part of Masjid al-Nabawi and explored all of it. But when we don't know how the setup of the Masjid was decades ago, and what we see today, if we don't know how the society of the Prophet ﷺ was, we may think this is all of Islam. It's a beautiful practice of Islam. It's certain opinions that we take and we follow that might be best for our community or the community of Medina right now. But just as women to take a step back and recognize that this isn't necessarily how even this masjid looked throughout history. And we don't know what it's going to look like in 20 to 30 years. We may be the ones who have stories of we could go there, or maybe we couldn't go there, and now it's open. Recognizing that there's a difference between the infrastructure and revelation is so important, especially when we look at the reality of who women scholars were. Because in these holy spaces, in Masjid al-Aqsa, we have Umad Daruda, who was a scholar, who used to teach in Masjid al-Aqsa itself. And if you go today to Masjid al-Aqsa, you see there that there are um, the Imam, Sheikh Yusuf Abu Sinana, mashallah, he's so accessible. He's there sitting there. You can have a woman scholar teaching with him. People are taking classes. Everything is open. The infrastructure is different. Does that make it better or worse? No, it's just different and it works for that culture, that community. But it's the third holiest space in Islam. And this is acceptable in their scholarship. Then we go to Medina. In Medina, there was a sheikha, her name was Sheikha Fatima, Umm al Khair Sheikha Fatima. You know where the Prophet وسلم, is buried? There's like a kind of like a gate. She used to sit with her back, reclining on that gate, and men and women scholars would sit and she would teach them. And then she would hand write ijazah for them. In Mecca, we have women who would come who were scholars. They would come for Hajj, and they would sit in Mecca in different circles, and they would teach Sahih al-Bukhari because they were some of the greatest contributors to Sahih al-Bukhari, the greatest memorizers and narrators of Sahih al-Bukhari. Sitta al-Wuzara in Cairo, she was invited to come from Syria, and hundreds of men and women filled the hall in the masjid where she would lecture to them. These are examples we don't really see today, honestly, not somewhere, that, not somewhere that we here may be used to seeing. But it's part of our history, and it's taking place in different parts of the world. Of course, with all the proper Islamic guidelines, of course, with all the etiquette, of course, with all of the important things to make sure that it's appropriate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we see in the time of the woman companions until now is that women were teaching women Women were learning from men or teaching men or only focusing on women. But we have the narrations, so many narrations from the woman companions because they were present, because they were accessible, and because they accessed the Prophet 
That's why when Dr. Akram Nadawi has so much, re so much uh, scholarship on the issue of women scholars, it's because they were there. Thousands of women throughout history teaching our religion. And we have their example set from the pillars of the women companions themselves. When Khawla radiallahu anha, when she was an older lady, an older woman, and Umar radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa at the time. She came to Umar radiallahu anhu and she stopped him while he was walking with a man named Al-Jarud. She stopped him and she said that she remembers when he was, Ya Umair, this little boy Umar, and now you're a big Khalifa. And you used to go and you used to tend in the markets of Rakaz with the sheep. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Jarud is like, do you, do you know who this is? You're talking to the Khalifa? Why would you let a woman, to Umar radiallahu anhu, why would you let a woman, oh, an elder woman talk to you like this? You're the Khalifa. And Umar radiallahu anhu responded, do you know who this is? Allah from the seventh heavens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the, from the, from the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who listened to her and he revealed revelation because of her. If she was going to stand all day and talk to Umar radiallahu anhu, the only time he would have left is to pray salah and come back. This is Umar radiallahu anhu to prior to Islam. What did he say? We used to think nothing of women. Look at how Islam impacted the way that he saw women in society. Look at how the revelation was given because one woman went to Allah pleading and asking for her circumstance with her husband. Aisha radiallahu anha. When her husband passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was buried in her home. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, he was buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now she is thinking about her own death. Where is she planning to be buried? Where does she hope to be buried? Next to her husband sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and her father radiallahu anhu. But when Umar radiallahu anhu was passing away, he had a request. Could he be buried there? Could he be buried with his best friends? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and radiallahu an. And out of her sincerity, out of her love, out of her sisterhood, she allowed for Umar radiallahu anhu to be buried there. And if she wouldn't have said yes, today we would be visiting Umar and Abu Bakr and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, excuse me, Aisha radiallahu anha, and Abu Bakr radiallahu an and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But instead we have the honor of visiting Umar and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And why I want to end with that note is because we live in a time right now where sometimes when it comes to men and women, there's a lot of confusing issues. There's a lot of um, tension. There can be a lot of arguments. But go back to the women companions. Go back to Aisha radiallahu anha. She didn't do this act as a political act. She didn't do this act because of controversy. She did this act out of love for her brother, radiallahu an. The Quran teaches us that as women, we are seen, we are heard, that Allah is with us, that he knows what we're going through, and that when we carry this message, we are, inshallah, the embodiment of the people who are ibadur rahman, ibadur rahman, those who are the servants of the most merciful, calling others like Maryam alayhi salam did to the most merciful. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor us with being all of those people who are the most merciful. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we have the immense honor of having Dr. Haifa here. Alhamdulillah, and I'm so excited to hear her talk, inshallah, right now. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashidu wa na ilaha ila anna astaghfirika wa natubu wa alaykum.